It's a wild day in the world of Magic the Gathering. The Outlaws of Thunder Junction teaser list has just been dropped. We've got insane tribal lords, crazy new tokens, and maybe even a cactus bard. Magic. I am a wizard. History. I'm an old wizard. The Magic Historian. My bones hurt. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. My friends, I hope the day finds you well because we have gathered for a special teaser edition of Mega Magic News. And if you don't know how this works, every time before a set comes out, Rosewater gives us incomplete information, just snippets of what we're gonna get to see. And unlike some sets in recent history, Thunder Junction has not experienced that many leaks. We have seen some cards from some booster packs, but ultimately a lot of the information that's gonna be revealed is brand new and we can use what we've already learned to pinpoint what some of this stuff is. So we're gonna dive right in with the magical goodness. We're gonna start out at the top of the list where we're talking about things you can expect first off. So a new batch of five related creature types. If you don't know what this means, it means there are going to be abilities that trigger off a particular subset of creatures. And we already know this one from the spoilers we've seen. The five connected creature types are all considered outlaws and includes things like rogues and assassins, that makes sense. But they also shoved shamans in there, which feels a little bit weird because I mean, as a shaman, you're not necessarily an outlaw. Rogues, assassins, absolutely are. So in terms of the flavor, it's mostly bang on. I don't really mind it because it just means you can get more versatility out of the ability. And shamans, I suppose, aren't really like, I, I, not from the law abiding perspective, but they're kind of out there, hedge wizards, whatever you want to call it. So I let that part slide. Moving on, we've got a card capable of returning three different card types from the graveyard to the battlefield. Now, this could either just say, put a creature, artifact, or enchantment back into play, or this literally could be put three different permanents back into play. But either way, we've seen as magic has progressed that cards are getting more options. This is what we were told was gonna happen, especially with commons and uncommons, because the change to play boosters has, ne has necessitated a change in design. So you have a situation where because there are fewer cards overall, especially in the common category, they have to make more of an impact for the limited formats, which means you can't have these side cards that don't do as much. That's why you'll see cards that used to say, like for two mana, destroy an artifact or enchantment at instant speed. Now virtually every one of those has something extra tacked on. Either do one of those and get a food or gain two life or get a plus one plus one on one of your guys or just a third ability on the card, destroy an artifact, enchantment, or a flying creature or a creature with higher power. Like this is just the way things are going overall. After that, we've got a mechanic players have been asking us to do for many years gets made as the setting was the perfect place to finally do it. This one isn't obvious to me. I was looking at it going, okay, what is a mechanic people have been asking for that fits in? It can't, I, I can't be plot, right? Plot doesn't feel like an ability people have really been looking for, unless it turns out that a bunch of people have been clamoring for it, and I just don't know. But this one, I would say, is one of the biggest ones that I'm unsure of. So if you have guesses on that, let me know. After that, we got dual lands with a land subtype that has never been on dual lands before. So that, I believe, have we already had dual style deserts? That, that might be what it is. Otherwise, that's going to be something else. But I suspect it has to do somehow with the deserts, right? So it's not, it's, I, they're not going to do a cave tie-in to make it like kind of sync up with Caverns of Ixalom. At least that's not what I'm expecting. So... After that, we've got a new modal mechanic that introduces something different to think about. Okay, so this is a new mechanic where you get multiple options, but you have to think about things in a different way. That's super, super vague. So I don't, <laughs> I don't have much to say in particular with that one. The one after it is a card that can swap 
or exchange control of up to three different card types. Now this one I've actually already seen and it's a super interesting card. The idea behind it is it's a blue spell where you can pay extra, you pay two to start off and then you pay an extra amount based on how many different things you wanna swap. So it's like pay two mana, so you're paying four in total to swap control of two creatures. You can pay three mana in total to swap control of artifacts or I think it's the same kind of thing for enchantments, right? So basically you can build a swap overall and you can, you can trade three different types of permanents in one go which has some really fun effects i've always enjoyed the juxtapose style effects that was the first card that really did that back in the day juxtapose and gauntlets of chaos from the original days but with gauntlets of chaos you literally had to spend 10 mana to swap a permanent with your opponent in total this spell at most i think costs seven and you get to swap three things right and obviously when it comes to people playing commander and everything it becomes far more enticing because you can swap all these different things around and there are particular decks that care about your opponents having your stuff so this card could actually be much bigger than it seems and i expect it to lead to absolute blowouts in limited because you can just go i'm going to take your best stuff and give you my worst stuff right so the limited format's probably going to absolutely love that card after that we've got a new creature token that has an ability no creature token has ever had before so this could be one of two things this could be the rogue tokens there are a bunch of cards that we've seen already from thunder junction where they make little mercenary tokens right so they're like one one creatures that uh, they're basically can tap to pump your other guys or themselves up they have the ability to tap give target creature plus one plus zero so we've seen abilities like that in the past and i believe there's tokens that have that kind of ability as well but i could be wrong about that so either it's going to turn out to be those mercenary tokens or there's some other token that has a brand new ability that isn't that and for excitement's sake i'm hoping it turns out to not be the little little tappy outlaw tokens that you make i'm hoping it's going to be something else but let's move on to the next item uh tribal card for skeletons and zombies I fully expect this to be Gisa and Giraffe, the two necromancer siblings who are always messing with each other. And I, I like the interplay between them a lot of the time because I think their rivalry is very amusing. The sister is completely unhinged. And the brother, I wouldn't say he's exactly normal, but he's the saner of the two. And so he has to deal with the insanity of his sister. Those guys can be a lot of fun. So I'm expecting that's going to be the card based on them. Then we've got creature tokens in the set. Some might have abilities. We've got 1-1 one, one white sheep, 1-1 one, one blue bird, 1-1 one, one black vampire rogue, 1-1 one, one red mercenary. Those are the tokens that tap to give you the plus one plus zero. 2-1 uh, green varmint. Yes. Okay. You know what? That's fun. I <laughs> Varmint. I, how did I not notice that when I read this before? Okay. 2-2 two, two white ox. Pay attention. There's something crazy going on with the oxen in this set, man. On top of there being like a flying holy cow. Wait until we get later on in this list. Anyways, 2-2 two, two white spirit, 2-2 two, two blue and black zombie, 3-1 red dinosaur. Where are dinosaurs coming from on Thunder Junction? That's a curious one to me. I mean, it's not going to have anything to do with Whatley because they're having a rogues gallery of villains shoved onto the world, right? So after that, we've got 3-3 three, three white angel, 3-3 three, three green elk, which we know from Oko. I wish that Oko was actually turning people into elks in the story to back that up, but he hasn't really been using his uh, his skills. So after that, 4-4 four, four red scorpion dragon. So that's got to be a cool, right? Like a cool is the only scorpion dragon in the entire set, as far as I understand. And his gang is made up out of regular humans and other ne'er-do-wells, but there are no others. So I presume that there's some kind of spell that a cool, like you, you go, oh, destroy target land, do two damage to your opponent and bring out a scorpion. And it's like, a cool's devastation. That kind of thing, right? That's the vibe that gives me. We've got an XX green elemental and a star star blue ox which is it's like is it some kind of it's not an illusion it doesn't have the illusion subtype what kind of blue ox is that like guys i don't know it's is paul bunyan a frontier kind of thing could they do like a paul bunyan's the gigantic guy right he's like the gigantic lumberjack dude who had like a a big pet ox was it blue i don't know man that's just what my brain jumped to but i have no clue 
after that, we've got some of the planes with legendary villains in this set. So it lists it lists a bunch of planes. You've got Dominaria, Eldraine, Fiora, uh, Innistrad, Ixalan, Kaladesh, Kaldheim, Kamigawa, New Capenna, and Ravnica. For me, this is the least exciting teaser out of all of them because the villains really are shoved into Thunder Junction. 100%. There's no rhyme or reason as to why they're there. So they're like, there's going to be somebody from Eldraine. Yeah, it's Ariette. And why is Ariette there? Because the last time we saw her, Ashiok was saying, I'm spiriting you away. I have another kingdom for you to be queen of. And now she's in Thunder Junction playing the piano. When she sees Kellen, she goes, if I knew you were going to be a part of this, I would have asked for more money. And it's like, wait, but you're getting paid for this? What happened? So the story reasons for them being there makes no sense. And so it's hard to get excited about the people being there. Who cares that they, wow, we got some, Gaunty came from Kaladesh or something. Is he going to do anything in the story? Nope, but get excited. So for me, there's nothing behind it. They didn't put in the effort to make it work. Look at Rakdos in the story. All he does is stare in a window angrily and then punch Ralzarek. Shows up nowhere else in the rest of the story. Invading Tarnation, nowhere to be seen. Stopping a train, nowhere to be seen. So that part for me is a letdown. Now, let's move on. Next, here are some rules text that will be showing up on cards. Then repeat this process X more times. So this could be anything. It could be a spell like one white and X, gain three life, then repeat this process X more times. That's a really basic way of doing it and they would really word it otherwise. But I'm just trying to give you an idea that it could be anything. Draw a card, repeat the process X times. So it doesn't really give you much information other than there's probably gonna be something with a big fat X spell, right? Next up, if it wasn't cast or no mana was spent to cast it. Now, this could go one of two different ways. They can either reward you for that when it's like, yo, you get to do this because you cast this or you didn't like because you didn't normally cast this using mana, you get a reward. But they can also use that as a downside on big, powerful creatures, basically saying this ability only works if you cast it legitimately. If you didn't cast the spell or you didn't spend mana on the spell, you don't get this effect. Or in the worst case scenarios, sacrifice whatever the permanent is. So you get to put it out, use it, and then if you didn't pay mana for it or cast it from your hand, you instantly sack it. So that could either be a benefit or a negative. After that, we've got plotting cards from your hand costs two less. So plotting is very similar to foretelling. What you do is you pay the plot cost, you remove the card over into exile, and then on a future turn you can cast it. But foretell made you pay a specific cost when you foretell the card. Plot you pay all up front. So you pay all the mana, and then when you want to cast a spell, it's free. So that's something that definitely is going to make storm players happy. Plotting is an interesting ability. We'll have to see how hard they lean into it. So without knowing how hard they lean into it, it's difficult to know how much having cards cost two less to plot will really affect things. Then we've got, you can't cast this spell during your first, second, or third turns of the game. We've seen this ability before on things like, there's like an angel you can get, and it's like two mana for a 4-4 four, four flyer, but you can't cast it first, second, third turn, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if it's exactly that, some kind of angelic creature, something along those lines, it doesn't have to be an angel, but a creature that you can't cast for the first three turns. So if you can find ways to cheat it into play, you can get it out early. And I find that kind of design space to be interesting. And I wonder mechanically, like compared to flavorfully, how does that work? I understand the mechanics, but how does it work when it comes to the actual magic of it, where it's just like, okay, I haven't been here long enough establishing a connection with my mana to the point where I can't draw this being into existence, even though I theoretically have enough magic energy. I'm not attuned to it enough. It is an interesting perspective from flavor. Now, next up, we've got this card gains flashback zero, or that card gains flashback zero. My guess is it's like uh, target a spell in your graveyard, and then it gets flashback zero, right? Unless it just says... Whenever you cast, like, you could have some crazy red-blue mage, Ultra Gungus, who says, whenever you cast a spell, that spell gains flashback zero until end of turn. So you can get it, and he's like, quick draw, McDouble draw, double slam, and that's how he does it, right? So that could easily be something along those lines. 
Then we've got target creature becomes a white rabbit with base power and toughness zero one. Now I got, I got that song from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas playing in my head and I'm picturing Buddy getting ready to whip the, here it comes, or whipping the grapefruit at him. Anyways, this white rabbit concept is great. I like this. This is going to tie into the humbling concept that we normally, well, actually we used to see with white specifically. It had a bunch of cards that would go, this creature becomes zero one. But blue has been moving somewhat into that category, right? They don't make a lot of zero ones. Blue tends to shrink creatures down to a one one. So it still can swing in, but it's lost its power. So I expect that this spell will straight up be a white spell that turns the, uh, turns the creature into a rabbit. The question is, how long does it last for? It can't be an enchantment, right? Because it says target creature, and that's not what it says on enchantments. It could theoretically be some kind of mage who turns people into bunnies. A bunny mancer. Yo, that would be fun. Okay, that's cool. All right, next up, what do we got? If you win that flip, copy that spell. All right, we've seen a bunch of stuff like that in the past, right? We had Stitch in Time where you flip a coin, and if you win the toss, you get to go ahead and take an extra turn. So pretty straightforward with that. After that, if a triggered ability of a legendary creature you control triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. A legendary-based panharmonicon ability? That's going to go over quite well with people. Pretty straightforward, right? After that, you get that many additional upkeep steps after this phase this is a really really strange wording right like you get a bunch of extra upkeeps which is not normal to begin with we've seen things like paradox haze which people love by the way it's an enchantment you put on yourself and you get an extra upkeep a lot of the time upkeep is a part of the game that's completely ignored if you don't have cards that mention it or you don't have shenanigans you want to do but the upkeep can be super powerful when you have cards that trigger during it. So having multiple upkeeps is insane. But the most interesting part is it says that it's after this phase. So depending on when and how you can cast this, you could theoretically have upkeep steps during your opponent's turn, right? Like they might make it a sorcery and you can always say like you can only play it on your turn or whatever. If they say you can only play it on your turn instead of just making it a sorcery, then even if you can give it flash, you can't get around that. But if it doesn't have those requirements, then you literally can have upkeeps happening not just at weird parts during your turn, but during your opponent's turn as well. And the upkeep effects of certain cards are super powerful. Being, to relo being able to relocate them to different parts of the turn is very, very potent. After that, remember I said keep your ears out for the oxen stuff? Oxen you control have double strike. Ollie, ollie, oxen in your face. Nobody's getting out free. <laughs> so I love it. I love the idea that you can have a flying holy cow double striker with this set, right? That's, that's goofy fun. I mean, I am here for that part of it. So next up, we've got creature type lines from the set. So we've got armadillos, shark, a shark rogue. That's a weird one. Plant Bard. That's the one that had me so excited that I actually pulled out a little, check out the little cactus that I painted for Thunder Junction. And I was going to show it up, but then I realized, wait a minute, the green screen's going to make it disappear. So <laughs> anyways, the idea of a little musical like Troubadour Cactus Dude, I love it. That's so much fun. Like Cactuar. Wow. From Final Fantasy, bro. That's awesome. Okay. So after that, we've got uh, Coyote. Sure. That makes sense. Homerid mercenary? What? Ha a Homerid? The Homerids were from like the, the old days of like alliances and fallen empires and stuff. And they're full on seagoers. They're like crustacean lobster men, bro. How are they not going to cook to death out in the sun? How does this guy survive? That's a huge question. After that, we got a rhino brawler. Probably somebody who came over from Capenna. Uh, we got a creature... Ox Angel, Ox Angel. That's the holy cow, by the way, which is, it's so goofy. It is a cow that I suspect that bootleggers might be using to make Halo because it has angelic essence. And that is, that's nuts. After that, we've got a porcupine mount. Well, that sounds like a terrible idea. Why would you, you gotta be a sucker for pain for that, man. Okay, well, that's what it says. And then they've got a legendary creature, core advisor, legendary creature, giant scout. Okay. And now some names of cards in the set. Claim Jumper. That guy probably makes treasure tokens, right? Form a posse. 
That card probably slaps out some goblin tokens or no, 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 not goblin tokens. What am I talking about? This is the outlaw set. It's going to slap out mercenary tokens, right? Uh, you've got gold rush, probably another one about treasure tokens. You've got the great train heist. So I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of these are just get treasure, destroy stuff. You've got high noon, which is going to be a fight spell. I presume, right? That's got to be a green spell. ka -chunk. Kachunk, this town ain't big enough for you, me, and your mother. Ba -bow! Right? Like that. <laughs> that's what that says to me. Then you got Quick Draw, which is that. I mean, that could be a fight spell. Give your creature plus one, plus one, or give a creature plus one, plus one, and first strike. Right? And it and it fights an opponent a creature until end of turn. Something like that. Something like that. Reach for the sky. I want. Uh, what would that do? That's maybe a stun counter kind of spell that like stops your opponent's creatures for a bit uh what's next resilient roadrunner meep meep uh <laughs> shoot the sheriff i didn't all right oh wait i did i did but i didn't get the deputy right <laughs> but it was in self-defense so that that's got to be like a red black straight up destroy target creature and then you're just gonna have like i presume somebody laying in like a pole like a a puddle of molten lava or something while a beat up like star is like lawman star is half stuck in the dirt right uh and then we've got this town ain't big enough i told you i half of these names i predicted i told you they would have these tropey things now admittedly I, they don't feel like the names of spells to me. Like, this town ain't big enough doesn't sound like a spell. Urza's punch you in the mouth doesn't sound like a spell either, but Urza's fire blast does, right? So this set does do that kind of thing, which I'm not a huge fan of, but at this point, it's firmly entrenched in magic. So the fact that I don't like it doesn't change nothing. Anyways, that wraps up all the teasing and pleasing I have for you guys today. Thanks for coming by and hanging out. I will catch you in the next video. Big shout out to all of my patrons. Thank you very much for supporting my channel. See you guys next time.